Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSET, working for communities across New York State. Hey now, let's take a moment So we all can figure it out What it's all about It's the Homework Hello, welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Laura Drake. And I'm Donna Minio. Homework Hotline is the place where you can get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. For more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games, other online resources, and the latest episode of our show. Today is Monday, and that means it's time for the math maze. All right, here we go. Bryce Harper of the Washington Nationals had a batting average of .319 for the 2017 season. If he has 785 career hits out of 2,756 career at-bats, what is Bryce Harper's career batting average as of 2017? All right, we'll give you a few seconds to write this down. Again, tonight's math maze is Bryce Harper of the Washington Nationals had a batting average of .319 for the 2017 season. If he has 785 career hits out of 2,756 uh, at-bats, what career at-bats, what is Bryce Harper's career batting average as of 2017? If you think you can solve the math maze, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer it on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly and you could have a chance to share the answer at the end of the show. Every correct response will be added to our Hotline Hall of Fame. Earn enough points and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. All right. Opening day for baseball was March 29th, and we figured this was the perfect time to take a different look at baseball. This week on Homework Hotline, we will be taking a look at the physics of baseball and softball, working on word problems, and converting miles per hour to feet per second. Tonight, we are going to kick things off by taking a look at the differences between softball and baseball. All right, so I'm gonna go over to the board. Sounds great. <coughs> All right, so, I'm guessing that a lot of you guys know a lot about baseball already. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But we're going to talk, first of all, just the differences in baseball. I'm not going to talk about the rules. I'm just going to talk about the differences between the field, a little bit about the differences in their geometry. So here is your traditional American baseball field, right? So when it's set up, you know, they call it a baseball diamond. And here's the baseball diamond. It's not really a diamond. It's a square, right? It's tilted here. Each of the sides here from home base to first place is 90 feet, 90 feet, 90 feet, 90 feet. And across the whole thing from home base all the way to second base is 127 and a little bit more feet. Okay, so that's something to think about. A lot of people think since this is 90, 90, 90, they think across here is 90, but it's not. And that, that would be the Pythagorean theorem. We're not going to talk about that right now. But so like that, that's the basic thing of a baseball um, baseball stadium, how baseball field, how it's set up when we're talking about the infield. Okay, so now I want to talk a second about the softball field. So remembering that this is 90 feet from home base. To, uh, to first base. Now, when we go to a softball field, again, we've got the diamond in here. See the diamond shape, which is really just a square, the tilted square, okay? But when I look here, the difference between home plate and first base is 60 feet, okay? That's 30 feet less. It's actually two-thirds the distance, okay? So if it's 90 and we're talking about 60, it's two-thirds the difference of, of, the, of what it's going to be where you have to run. So, all right, like, all right, what difference is that going to make? It's going to make all the difference in the world when we're talking about softball and baseball, okay? So let's think about all the things that change between baseball and softball when it's only 60 feet across, okay? First of all, you get up at bat. The pitcher from here is only 35 feet. They're a little bit closer to the halfway point. They're 35 feet, where if we go back to the baseball... The pitcher's mound is 60 feet, right? So it's almost half closer, or we could say baseball is twice as much, 
um, than the softball field. So we're back to the softball field, so it's half as much. So when you go, when the softball pitcher releases the pitch, it's already only going 30 feet. It's going 30 feet less, which means it has less time to travel to get where it has to go. So you're like, all right, so, all right, the ball comes, has to go half the distance. Um, baseball pitches, we'll talk about that more later than this week, go really, really fast, and so do softball pitches, but it's going in the shorter distance. So think about it, how far you have to throw it, it only has to cover cover half as much, which means if you're the batter in softball, you have like, they release the ball and the ball's already over the plate, right? So you have less than half a second. I think it's 35 one hundredths of a second from the time the pitcher releases the softball to the plate is where it gets over the plate. So this is gonna be the batter, doesn't have enough time to really think about it, okay? So that's gonna change things up. The next thing that's gonna happen is when they go to run the bases. So all right, you hit the ball, uh, the fielder catches the ball in softball, and then they throw it to first base, they don't have to run as far, so they're gonna get there a lot faster. So you have to throw the ball quicker if you're like a shortstop to get it all the way over to first base. So the big difference between softball and baseball in terms of the field is that the softball field is smaller, the baseball field is bigger, but that totally affects the game because things are faster in softball than they are in baseball. So now we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the difference of the field. And we're just gonna kinda do a little sorting exercise, right? We got baseball and we've got softball. And we got some clues here about them and we're gonna talk about the difference of them as we go through them. So on here I have one that says the distance from home plate to the pitcher is 43 feet, okay? And I'm gonna look on here and there's another one that talks about the distance between the picture. And it says um, the uh, distance from home plate to the picture is 60 feet. So remember what we said, the softball field was shorter, which means the ball gets over there quicker. So that one's gonna be for 43 feet, and this one is gonna go over at 60 feet. Shorter the distance, the quicker the ball gets there. Quicker your reaction time needs to be. All right, the next thing we have here is underhand pitching. Okay, softball, we're gonna talk later in the week about that, but softball is underhand pitching. I'm not gonna demonstrate right now and overhand pitching as goes with baseball. So those are the two that is they compare themselves. All right, I wanna go back and talk about distance because I'm a math person, I love talking about the numbers. It says the distance between the bases is 90 feet. We already talked about that, right? The longer, longer field between a home plate and first base is baseball. And do you remember what the distance was between the other two? It was 60 feet. The difference between the two bases was 60 feet. All right, so now we got a few other things to talk about. I didn't talk about the pitching mound in softball and baseball. In baseball, there's a pitching mound. A mound means it's higher. It's about 10 inches, I think, off the ground, okay? Softball, you're on the flat surface. There's no mound. You're pitching straight up, so you don't, even, you don't have the advantage of being above and having time for the ball to curve down. So flat pitching surface is gonna go to softball, and elevated pitching surface is gonna to go to baseball. An interesting thing though is the rubber plate is the same on both of them. It's the same size plate that they stand at, but one is higher for baseball and the other one is lower. All right, innings, seven innings versus nine innings. Everybody knows baseball has nine innings, which means that softball has seven innings, so you gotta score. You don't have time to rally later on. You gotta to get to business, gotta get your points in. No time to drag it on before we have to do it. Okay, infield. Infield, we saw back on the picture, it's just a quick, in case you guys aren't sure what infield is. This is the infield, closer to the field, that's the outfield. So when we come back here, who's gonna have the smaller infield? Of course it's gonna be softball, because everything's tighter together. And then when we talk about baseball, baseball is gonna be the 16,000 feet. When you look at that, because I love talking about numbers, it's twice as big. You have to run twice as far in baseball. But you're like, oh, that, that's, that's hard, but think about the speed. If you have to run twice as far, you have twice as long for the ball to get there, right? Softball, bam, like that ball's gonna, you gotta get that ball there fast. All right, the last thing we have here is we're gonna uh, con compare the ball, the size of the ball, okay? Now here's where it's a little bit different. On softball we said uh, the field and everything was smaller. On uh, baseball it was larger, but here's where it's different. The softball is actually bigger, has a bigger surface area. The softball is between 11.8 inches in circumference, which means all the way around the ball. And the baseball measures between nine and nine and a quarter of the ball, which makes it smaller. So that is kind of the math behind the difference between baseball and softball. So get out there and play. Fraction help. 
How to change a mixed number into an improper fraction. Make it mad. M, multiply the denominator by the whole number. A, add the numerator. D, denominator stays the same. how much energy it took to grow your food, wash it, and get it to your grocery store? Estimates state that 30% of our global energy use goes into food production. Those energy costs are hidden throughout our entire food chain. Take a look. Yeah, we've got some kale growing here. And there are few places where the connection between food and energy is more obvious than at the Bright Agritech warehouse in Laramie, Wyoming. You know, I didn't know that these were edible, though. You didn't? No, I didn't. Not until they planted them. Bright Agritech sells growing systems to indoor farmers. CEO Nate Story says because of that, he thinks about energy a lot. When we start paying for electricity directly, it becomes obvious that we're in an energy industry. We're consuming energy to, to create this produce. In Bright Agritech's case, the kale and microgreens and edible flowers are a direct product of coal, which supplies most of Wyoming's electricity. Yeah, I'm going to turn on a few. Is that all right? The energy inputs are obvious in the Bright Agritech warehouse. But they're hidden everywhere in our food supply chain. Up to a fifth of our nation's total energy use goes into growing, transporting, processing, and eventually preparing our food. Just need another uh, two ounces. Hayden Christensen thinks about that energy every day. And how many hours a day are you gonna have these lights on? I'll probably work them up to 14 to 18, roughly. Christensen grows herbs and lettuce in grow rooms and greenhouses just outside Fort Collins, Colorado. He uses new high-tech LED lights. They're just, they're a lot more efficient. Um, these are 300 watt, they say they're an equivalent of an 1,000 watt uh, regular light. Although labor and packaging are Christensen's biggest expenses, he says energy costs do add up. He estimates that in an average clamshell of basil, which retails for $1.50, nine cents was spent on electricity. Once his herbs are packaged, Christensen loads them up and takes them to a local Whole food store where they're sold. In this case, that trip is short. But even longer trips, say from a farm in California to the same Fort Collins Whole Foods, don't actually use a whole lot of energy, says ag economist Don Thilmany. Everyone does assume, because they see the trucks, the trucks are the visible part, that the transportation sector is a huge part of both the cost and the energy of food production, and they're really quite minimal. Transportation accounts for less than 10% of all the energy used in the food chain. So what does actually consume a lot of energy? The store itself. We used 3 million kilowatt hours last year, which equates to approximately $240,000 for one year of electrical usage. In essence, all of our systems kind of competing with one another. You have HVAC trying to compete with the refrigeration, refrigeration is trying to compete with the heat outside. Lighting is also uh, struggles based on daytime versus nighttime, so if any of the systems are off by a little bit, uh, it, it somewhat creates issues throughout the whole environment of the store. In other words, the fridges and freezers that keep your salad fresh and ice cream cold add up. Whole Foods has also installed more efficient lighting as well as solar panels on the roofs of many of its stores. But it turns out retailers aren't even the biggest energy consumers in the food supply chain. In fact, they aren't even the second biggest. That distinction goes to something we consumers almost never see. The food processing sector. Even when we're buying at stores now, we're wanting things convenient. So we used to buy heads of lettuce, now we buy bag salad mixes. Or we used to buy chicken, now we buy the chicken already rotisseried with a marinade on it. So um, all those things that were in the name of convenience have tended to both make it be more energy intensive and more processed in a way. All that processing contributed to food-related energy consumption growing six times faster than overall energy consumption between 1997 and 2002. But the biggest energy consumer of all is also the most hidden. 
American households. Estimates vary, but approximately one third of all the energy we use to produce food is consumed by us. Italian parsley. Craig Hibbert is an Inside Energy viewer and a former home energy auditor. He got in touch with us about monitoring energy use at home. And I use these little kilowatts to monitor the refrigerators. Then he puts all the information into a spreadsheet so he can geek out on the numbers. You know, a refrigerator uses uh, constant energy every day. And I, a lot of people put an extra refrigerator out in the garage, put some soda pop in it. And when you take into account the hundreds of millions of refrigerators, dishwashers, ovens, freezers, extra freezers we all have in our homes, the energy use is enormous. We're not intentionally making bad decisions, we're just uninformed. People will just make very constrained decisions on whatever's there, what's convenient. But in the next few years, expect to see more attention paid to the energy and climate impacts of our food. Today, people often look for organic or local labels on their food. In the future, perhaps they'll be looking for energy efficiency labels too. For Inside Energy, I'm Stephanie Joyce. You know, that video is really an eye opener because I don't know, I've never really thought about how much energy is going into putting that food just in the grocery store, not even into my plate, you know? Yeah, I know, like the grocery store, you're like, look at all the lights, look at all the energy, look at their freezer box that's open and the cold air coming on, right? Or, or me standing there trying to decide what kind of ice cream <laughs> I'm gonna eat, their refrigerator door open. So just a lot of wasted energy there. And then just the fact that in our home is also where the biggest right. waste people. So try to be a little more conscientious of that stuff. If you'd like to see this video again or others like it, head to our website, homeworkhotline.org and click on videos. All right, you gave a great segue into my lesson. All right. I'm going to actually compare a softball pitcher and a baseball pitcher. Oh, great, love it. Okay, all right, come along. All right, the first person I'm gonna talk about is Jenny Finch, and Jenny Finch is actually a softball pitcher. Um, she started pitching at the age of eight. So all my second, third, fourth graders out there, you can still do this. She started at eight. She um, actually was the pitcher in the 2004 Olympics and they got a gold medal for Team USA. And then again in 2008, she got a silver medal. They lost to Japan during the gold medal um, game. In 2010, she played for Team USA. And then in 2010, 2009, 2007, 2006, and 2005, she was a World Cup champion. So she's pretty good. Um, she played for the Chicago Bandits from 2005 until 2009, but now she actually runs softball camps for kids. If you talk about baseball, you have, I'm going to talk about Clayton Kershaw. Now, I was talking to some friends of mine um, because I don't know a lot about baseball, um, and I, they keep everything I was reading said, he's a left-handed pitcher, he's a left-handed pitcher. So I asked somebody, I said, is this unique? What, why do they keep bringing up the left-handed piece? And they said, it is, they told me it's very unique to be left-handed and be a pitcher and be successful the way he is. He plays for the Los Angeles Dodgers and he has played for them in the Major League B Baseball um, since 2008. His first playoff game, starting game, was in 2009. He actually launched Kershaw's Challenge and wrote a book called Arise to raise money to help build an orphanage in Zambia. And he was awarded the Roberto Clemente Award and the Branch Rickey Award for his humanitarian work. Now, they both have done a lot out there for pitching, but let's take a look at their actual statistics. And Jenny Finch is actually six foot one. Look at that, Clayton Kershaw, six foot four. Both pretty good. Oh, okay. So I need to clarify that we're actually talking about the 2009 season, all right? So th that this way we're talking about the same year and everything, for both of these pitchers. Now, the record for 2009 for Jenny Finch was 7-2. And now, Laura told you, they, they play less games. And the record for Clayton Kershaw was 8-8. Eight eight. And so he had a 50% there. Um, she actually played in 13 games and started eight of those games. 
he played 31 and started 30 of them. So he's got a higher percentage of starting in the um, baseball pitching piece. Um, she's pitched 49 innings. He pitched 171. Well, I looked into that because um, I was like, why are they so far apart? Well, their seasons are shorter as well. Like baseball started now in March and it goes till about September. Softball is mid-May, end of May to the end of August. So it's a lot shorter time and it's a lot fewer teams. So now there's strikeouts. She struck out, in 49 innings pitch, she struck out 61 people. And in 171 innings pitched, he had 185 strikeouts. Now, look at the runs scored off of them. Now, you got to remember that she has fewer um, innings played than he does, but she only had 12 runs scored off her. And he actually had 55. Now, this is where I actually was really kind of interested. Top pitching speed for Jenny was 72 miles per hour. And for Clayton, it was 98 miles per hour. Well, I'm sort of, hmm, who's got the faster pitch? So let's sort of take a look at that. Now, as Laura said, the um, distance from the pitcher's mound to the um, home plate there is 43 feet and she did 72 miles per hour in 43 feet. Well, I want to know how many is she going to do in one? So you would do 72 miles per hour divided by 43 and I want to know what that is for one. So well, all I'm going to do is take that 72 and divide it by 43. 72 divided by 43 is equal to, oh, that's a big number. But this is saying that if we round it, 1.674, it keeps going. So I taught my kids when you round, you write everything down that your calculator shows, and then you do a squiggly equal. And I'm going to round it to 1.67. Now let's check out Clayton. He did 98 miles per hour, but remember, as Laura told you, the pitcher's mound is further away. It's 60 feet away. So we now have to do the 98 and divide it by 60, and I'll use y, so I'm using a different variable. Again, I want to know how many miles per hour per foot. So I'm going to, oh, look, it's a denominator of 1, so I just have to do this division. So 98 divided by 60 is equal to, oh, it goes on forever there, 1.633 repeating. Again, let's sort of round that, and y is equal to 1.63. I went two places, so let's go to, oops, I wrote the wrong number. 6.3, and now if you take a look, Jenny Finch actually has a faster pitch than Clayton Kershaw by 0 0.04. Because if you were to subtract the per foot, it's 1.67 minus the 1.63. So she's a little bit faster pitcher, but in, when all is said and done, that number's so small, they're almost equal. I hope you enjoyed. All right, we have a winner in tonight's math maze. We have Neil. Hello. Hello. Hi, is this Neil? Yes. Okay. What was the answer to the math maze, Neil? Okay. About 0 0.285. Yes. Perfect. How did you do that? Okay. So first, um, I divided 785 mm -hmm. okay. by 2,756. And you got? I got... 0.284833091413, and I rounded it to 0 0.285. That's that's a lot of math. Yeah, you did great. You did a great job on that. Are you a baseball fan, Neil? Yes. Who's your team? Mets. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's what I was hoping you were going to say. All right. Congratulations, Neil. Now, don't forget, every correct response goes into our homework hall of fame. Earn enough points, and you could win a tablet at the end of the season.
That's all the time we have for tonight. Tomorrow on Hotline, the Seneca Park Zoo will be here with a spiny creature that can roll itself into a ball. Good night. Good night. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSIC, working for communities across New York State.